Sarah Wiseman! Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Sarah, and I like numbers. Yeah, no, you're, you're right, you're right. That's a rubbish intro, isn't it? In fact, uh, if you use it at a party when you're meeting someone new, it's a really good way to ensure they don't want to give you their number. Really good for that. No, I, um, I'm doing my PhD currently, and I'm looking at the way that uh, humans interact with computers and the way that interfaces are designed. Uh, and the thing that I'm specifically interested in is what happens when we enter numbers on computers, and specifically, what happens when we enter them wrongly. Uh, now, when I'm talking about entering numbers, numbers wrongly. I'm not talking about what you do every Wednesday and Saturday night when you pick the wrong lottery numbers. I can't, I can't design an interface that will help you get that right. I mean, I can't design a legal interface that will help you get that right, really. Now, what I'm talking about is when you know the number, but for whatever reason, you enter it in wrongly. So, guys in the audience, uh, that's the excuse that you used that time you accidentally called that sex chat line. You remember that one? You remember that one? So uh, let's come up with a really nice topical example of number entry error. I am going to talk about Mars and NASA Yay. in the 90s. Um, yes, yeah, so that's right. Before Curiosity was up exploring Mars and while it was still more interested in killing cats. Um, yeah? yeah. probe up to Mars to, to find, about, find out a bit more about the planet. So this was this awesome exp like experiment they, they planned for years. And they built the thing, sent it off, and, you know, fantastic. It got off, and it was in space. Awesome. Now, things started to go a bit wrong when it got to Mars. When they turned on the thrusters, they found out that something had gone a little bit wrong. Uh, half of NASA thought that the units they were using were the sexy Newtons, and the other half of NASA thought they were using the m rather more classical pounds per square inch. Uh, this, uh, you don't have to be a scientist to know, isn't a good thing when you put the two together. And it turns out when the uh, Mars space cruiser got there, it cruised straight past Mars. <laughs> and yeah, they didn't get any results from that one. So you know what, it turns out you don't have to be a rocket scientist to enter numbers correctly. In fact, it, apparently you need more qualifications than that. Uh, and you know what, if the rocket scientists are getting it wrong, we probably need to check in with the brain surgeons as well. And that's what my research is looking at. I'm looking at the way that people enter numbers on medical devices. And if errors are made there, then people can get hurt and some people can die. So you know, if my research comes out all right, then I might be able to save some lives. And at the end of my PhD, I might be more like one of those doctors that's actually useful and less like an academic doctor. <laughs> so how do I find out about how people are entering numbers? Well, one of the really easy ways to do it is to just look at people entering numbers. But it turns out that people really don't want to get involved in scientific research. Seriously, they're completely against it, some of them. You know, I can tell them anything, you know, this research, if you help me with it, can further the future knowledge that we have on this subject and maybe together we can save some lives. Stop looking over my shoulder and trying to read my PIN number, respond, at which point I normally get chucked out of the shop. Um, so real world research, that's not working for me so well right now. So what I do instead is run lab experiments. Now when you think of a lab experiment, you might be thinking about bubbling chemicals in bottles and Bunsen burners and all sorts of things. Um, but what I do isn't like that. What I do is more like The Cube. Have you watched The Cube? <laughs> yeah, you have. Uh, but those who haven't, it's an ITV show presented by Philip Schofield. Uh, and he gets firemen and dinner ladies and all sorts of members of the public and then chucks them in a big glass box. Um, not, not all at the same time. That's, that's a different show entirely. Probably found on Channel 5 late at night. No, this show, uh, they get the members of the public to go in one by one and complete these really inane but really difficult tasks. And if they do it right, they get some money. And that is exactly what I do when I run a lab experiments. I get participants in to do difficult inane tasks for money. In fact, one of the last ones I saw on the cube, uh, the, the, uh, the game was just like one of my experiments. They had to enter some numbers in and sort them out, and then they won some money. Like, exactly the same. Uh, the only difference being that on the cube, when the contestant got it right, she won £20,000. And when my participant got it right, he had a fiver. Uh, <laughs> slightly different payoff. Uh, so, I don't just have to rely on results from my own experiments. I can look at experiments that people have done in the past. So back in the 80s, 
uh, when computers existed, but the internet didn't. And so as far as I can tell, the computers were entirely useless. Uh, people would sit at these computers waiting for the internet. And while they were doing that, you know, they were a bit bored. There were no cat videos to watch. And so they started running experiments, looking at the way that they typed. And because of this research, uh, I can tell you that you are able to uh, read some text and type it in, and whilst doing that, you can listen to some nursery rhymes and pay attention to them, and that will have no effect on the way that you type. You'll still type just as fast and just as accurately. You might think that's useless, right? But if your boss at work gets annoyed with you listening to music while you're doing your work, I have some academic research that shows that what you're doing doesn't hinder your work at all. Which is quite useful, quite useful. Um, what I don't have, on the other hand, is academic research to say why someone your age is still listening to nursery rhymes. <laughs> I, can't, I can't help you with that one. If we go even further back to the 60s, uh, people were doing research and trying to work out how numbers should be arranged on a telephone. So you know that three by three array that we're used to? You see it on telephones, calculators, cash points. That isn't a given. Like, people in America, in Bell Labs in the 60s, were deciding what that should look like. And they were insane, let me tell you. They were just absolutely nuts, okay? It was the 60s. The first layout that they thought for these numbers on a telephone Maybe we should arrange it like a rainbow. <laughs> or maybe a pyramid. Obviously, a pyramid. Now, okay, I kid you not. If Design 1B had won out, if these researchers who were designing the telephone that we know and love today had decided that Design 1B was the very best way you could lay out numbers, we would all be entering numbers on a crucifix. <laughs> Seriously, a crucifix. Who thought that was a good idea? Can you imagine, like, if you went up to a cash machine and you know you don't remember what numbers are really in your pin. No one does. You know what the pattern is, though, and you're practicing the pattern so you can remember. Instead of going up and doing this, you'd be walking up and doing this. <laughs> I have to admit, sometimes before payday, I'm still doing that when I walk up to the cash machine. Now, Interfaces don't have to be static. Now that we've got touch screens, they can all change and they can adapt to whatever task is happening right now. So you'll notice if you've got an iPhone or an Android that when you enter a URL, you get a little dot .com button appearing on the, on the keyboard. And if you enter an email address, you get an at symbol. And that's because these are really useful buttons to have because they're, it's a task you perform quite a lot in that circumstance. Um, my phone is personalised to me, uh, and it now offers me a button to go on Facebook and find out if my ex-boyfriend's girlfriend is prettier than me. <laughs> it's really good personalisation. Thank you, Apple. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> so if I want to adapt this sort of thing to, to number entry, I need to know about what sort of numbers are being entered and how often they happen and things like that. Now there's not a lot of research on this because it's freaking boring and only I'm interested in it. Um, but what we do know is this thing called Benford's Law. Now Benford's Law tells us that if you've got a naturally occurring data set like lengths of rivers, populations of cities, stuff like that, and you pick a number at random, 30% of the time that number will begin with a 1. That's, that's weird, that's weird, okay? It will most likely begin with a 1. If it doesn't begin with a 1, most likely to be a 2. Not a 2, most likely to be a 3. So you get the idea. One's very likely to begin with, nine's not very likely. And because that's so counterintuitive, it's a really good way of finding out if data has occurred naturally or if a human like Stephen is made Duncan have made up the data. <laughs> now, one th way that this has been used uh, recently was in the, uh, the Greek financial crisis. Now, they ran their, their like, financial data through Benford's Law and found out that it had been slightly fabricated uh, in the same sense that the news of the world was slightly nosy. <laughs> now, you don't just have to run it on countries. You can run it on people as well. Um, uh, no, I don't mean people. Uh, you can run it on MPs as well. <laughs> so, with the uh, recent expense claims stuff, uh, they ran that through Benford's Law and you get some interesting information. For instance, uh, Harriet Harman's data, that looks like Benford's Law. That's probably realistic. That's pretty good. Uh, Alistair Darling's stuff, loads of flipping threes and fours that cannot be explained by Benford's Law. <laughs> Seriously, loads of them. I don't know how they got there. I mean, I'll just leave that with you, but I will say, you know, an entire country, the entire country of Greece was pulled up for this, but Alistair Darling's expense claims still out there. Okay, I'll leave that with you. I'll leave that with you. Um, so, that's
that's what Benford's Law looks like. Uh, so I am interested in the medical domain. So I wanted to find out what numbers uh, were being entered in a medical context. So I did some research and there were really interesting patterns. Uh, aside from the fact that there were loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of zeros being entered. Loads of zeros. Boring amounts of zeros. And then a few ones and twos and fives. Uh, you know, if you think about it like at a school, it's like the number four is the uncool kid that never ever gets picked for sports or anything like that. So there you go, that's what the pattern looks like in a medical domain. So, if you're ever watching Casualty and you wonder what the numbers that they're entering on that machine are, then, you know, uh, you're a freaking loser. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after this we could probably be Facebook friends if you're interested. <laughs> Thank you very much everyone. Woo!